Um, this is how I typically introduce myself as um, I'm Dr. Jeremy Irvin. Please call me Jeremy. I am the founder and chief administrative officer for Community STEAM Academy in Xenia, Ohio. Uh, we provide innovative education of the heart, mind, body, and soul. It is located in Southwest Ohio, and we are opening up um, our inaugural year this fall with grades six through nine. Um, and we'll continue to roll out um, as we continue to add a grade every year. And then probably in year two, we'll have our K-5 open up. So we'll be eventually a K-12, uh, probably within four years. Um, and so my background has been in um, as a math and science teacher, transitioning to training future math and science teachers at the university level with a PhD in science education at the Ohio State University and been working in um, higher ed training teachers, continuing to take steps clear until I became a dean of a college of education um, and um, ultimately then saw the opportunity to make an impact in education by starting this um, innovative STEAM school uh, in Southwest Ohio. And so that's really what I've transitioned from higher ed to begin this school. Oh, so go ahead and start your presentation because you have 25 minutes and we're eager to see what you are going to show us today. All right, well, um, 25 minutes is actually fairly good length of time. So there'll be an opportunity to um, actually find and do more um, information um, at the end. So, and feel free as I go through to um, interrupt if there are questions. I'm okay with uh, taking some of those questions and answering them along the way. Um, so. We see your presentation. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, so I would encourage anyone as um, you're watching, feel free to go to communitysteam.org and see our website. And you're gonna see a lot of information about uh, our school. One of the things I wanna draw your attention to is our logo. Um, you'll see the logo from a distance kind of looks like a gear, which is kind of a STEM type idea. People see gears and think of engineering and design and things like that. And one of the things that I want to focus on is if you really look at it, it's not a gear, but it's a group of students uh, with unique colors around a project um, working in as a, as a community of learners to accomplish a task. And so the name community in the school title is very intentional. We are building community of learners. We are providing a direct link with community service learning opportunities. We are building um, partnerships with community businesses, nonprofits, um, organizations. We are looking at the workforce skills that are necessary to be advanced in our community. And we are emphasizing specific journeys along our educational uh, pathways to allow them to have those skill sets necessary to be um, good citizens, but also ultimately have a place in our um, careers and, and jobs. And so um, the, the icon is symbolic of really our mission and vision of um, the school. Ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna read the entire uh, mission there, but you're gonna see some of those bold words that stand out like change agents and contributors and being caring and creative and they are living and working in a challenging environment and that's very very important within our entire um, innovative education process um so let me explain why community steam academy is considered innovative all right um in ohio there are um, are different ways to become a, a public school. Um, one of the ways that has been uh, put into place almost, uh, I think it's 17, 18 years ago, was a STEM 
designation committee was formed in the state of Ohio to allow schools to become designated in the STEM and utilize some of the tax dollars that is built on an instructional formula to allow schools to do public education with the STEM emphasis. And then they added the arts, which is the STEAM. And over the last um, 18 years or so, they've accumulated a lot of different types of STEM designated and STEAM designated schools. Um, but there's four different ways to do that. One of those ways is as an independent school. And that is what we have become, one of those independent STEAM schools. We are one of eight. So there's not many of us in the state. And this allows us to provide that tuition-free K-12 education. We have to have an open admissions policy, which means we may not filter based on academic um, status or um, social economic status or anything geographical region. So anyone in the state, um, if they can get to our school building can come um, and so we don't have the, the typical geographical limitations that most local school districts have um, within a specific map that was um, agreed upon by the, the, the state legislation. Um, because of that, we allow for a lot of um, different communities to be part of it. And because of that, we want to reach a lot of different communities. And so we're open to doing both local and global type partnerships with the school. And when I say that, um, a lot of schools talk about that, but we actually will be implementing some of these projects right into our learning environment. And I'll give an example of that as I go a little bit further in the, the discussion uh, and talk about a day of a, in the life of a student at the school. Um, but we are truly passionate about the school and the way the reason it becomes innovative is we want to empower the students to overcome all of the potential barriers there are to learning. Um, and throughout my 30 plus years in education, I've seen a lot of things that hinder learning and we want to enhance learning. And so we want the school to be able to, to eliminate as many of those barriers that I saw throughout my um, time in education. And so that's kind of what we're, we're doing. Um, we are the first K-12 STEAM school in Ohio. Um, there are one, there's one other independent STEM school in Ohio that's K-12. It's Biotech um, in Rootstown, Ohio. We um, are the first independent to get a STEAM designation to integrate the arts we are the first um, STEAM STEM um, school in Greene County, which is the county in which our building is housed. Um, <clears throat> and within a 30 mile radius of us, there are two other independent STEAM schools, um, Global Impact STEM Academy and Dayton Regional STEM School, both of which give um, credibility to one, what we do in STEAM education, but two, we see the need for this kind of in innovative education because they have wait lists, some of times over a hundred students trying to get into the school um, because there's just not a lot of this kind of project-based student-centered instruction that is available. And so ultimately um, in Green County, um, we're meeting a need that we'll become the only general education non-home school-based public school option in the county. So if they don't go to the traditional schools or they don't pay a parochial or private schooling, their only other option is digital school. Um, and so we're providing that brick and mortar option for our students and that's really a big need. And so that's really the whole purpose of thus uh, providing this schooling there in Xenia, which is the city seat um, for the county, Green County. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are our core values that really permeate everything that we do. And our entire curriculum is designed around these core values. 
our teachers will be um, able to provide um, ability to show in a portfolio how they are aligned with these core values. And if they show a certain level of implementation, they can get merit pay beyond their typical base pay. And that's how important these core values are for us, our administration and our school board. We want to emphasize community service. We want to be able to build that culturally responsive type curriculum. We wanna meet the needs of the students and meet the needs of the community through service learning. Um, we are very much a holistic education approach. We understand that every student is unique in their way of learning, and we want to provide the potential way to help them be as successful as possible. And we want to express um, both through communication, but also creativity, allow them to follow their heart, their passion, their interests, but communicate that in an effective way so that <clears throat> they can be effective within our society. We wanna give them this confident identity. Um, one of the things that I always find fascinating is if someone can do something the first time and be successful at it, it doesn't really give them much inner strength. It is that person that has tried and failed, tried and failed and continuously tries, continuously fails, but eventually they are successful that they're like, yes, I got that, right? And it's meaningful. The gaming mentality of today's culture of our students, if anyone can jump on a new game and play it and be one of the top scorers, people don't love it. They, in fact, they'll find it a boring gaming um, type of a software product. The key is, is that it takes time to learn. It requires a lot of experience. Um, you need to score enough points within the experience level so that if you're coming in, you've got a, a repertoire of skills and resources available to you that are going to be by far more important in order to do the game and be successful at the game than someone just coming in. Well, that's life, right? So we want to provide a very challenging atmosphere, an environment where failure really means um, fail, first attempt in learning, and it's okay to fail, but we're there to help there as teachers to support them so that once they have accomplished it, they have this inner strength of saying, all right, bring it on. Like the little kid trying to break the, the wood in a karate class or, or some type of taekwondo. And the sensei is explaining how to do it. And he keeps failing and keeps failing, but a bunch of his peers come around him and cheer him on. And finally, after the, you know, the 10th time, he breaks it. And everyone picks him up and cheers and celebrates, right? That gut kid will say, bring on the next level, make it, you know, more, double it, I'll get it, you know? So that's what our school is about, is to create that confident identity, <clears throat> along with bringing in dynamic movement. Research shows that if students are able to be mobile, they're able to concentrate. There's a lot of good uh, chemicals that are released in the brain that allows for, for retention of information so you can accommodate and assimilate the new information, the new schema. That helps easier to recall. So we want to be able to incorporate movement as much as possible. Whether that's, you know, a first grader learning phonics and how to read and shapes and maybe have um, a sensory path projected on the floor from the ceiling with projectors where students can jump from space to space and they have to call out the soft blends, pH, and they can only do it on um, the blue cubes. Um, and so they're kind of looking and learning, practicing jumping and hopping and skipping or whatever the challenge is. And that will increase the opportunity for learning. We know this is the case. <clears throat> Most people you see talking on a cell phone, what do they do? They kind of pace, they move, they're up around, they're walking. They're not sitting still. 
Why? Because they actually can concentrate by moving better. So they're able to concentrate and we know this works, research shows it. So we wanna increase that. It becomes a core value for our class um, to implement this in our curriculum. These um, approaches within instruction are directly related to some of those barriers that we have seen across schooling. And so <clears throat> when we teach all the students the same way and we don't see them as individual students, um, we end up emphasizing content. Now, most of the time you talk to a teacher you say, oh, what are you a teacher of? And they're gonna say, you know, algebra, they're gonna say biology, they're gonna say history or economics or something. And that's a typical response, but in reality, if the target of a teacher is to teach content. Content doesn't need to learn. Students need to learn. Now they need to learn content, but it's the student that's the priority. So our approach will be that we are teaching students and we are helping them learn content, but it's a student that we have to key in first and foremost. So we wanna engage the students. We want them to be um, the center of the instruction. So we don't want a teacher just to get in front of the room and show how smart they are by uh, putting up on a PowerPoint slide and then explaining everything. We want students to be active learners. We want them to be engaged. <clears throat> so a student-centered instruction is very important for it. We realize that one size does not fit all. We want to personalize instruction. To do that, one of the best ways to do that is to become project-based, community-focused. When we do projects, we allow for a lot of tailoring of the instruction so that if students are doing the same project, but yet some are more advanced in some of the concepts of, say, algebra than others, some could be doing linear functions and others could be doing exponential functions, which are curve type functions. And that would be um, easily able to modify the project to tailor it to the needs of the students. <clears throat> it allows for us to emphasize the fact that every student has their own pathway. So we're not giving grades, we're actually using mastery learning we're gonna use a standard referenced report card so that when students are asked about their learning, they're telling it in a narrative. They're not telling it in, oh, I'm an A student. What does an A student really mean, right? Um, every teacher is a little different in how that occurs. And so instead of saying a percentage or a letter grade, they can specifically talk about that they were successful in explaining why two linear functions at an intersecting point was able to make this impact in the real world. <clears throat> so in order to do these projects effectively, we're utilizing um, the gold standard approach of project-based learning, which is um, a Buck Institute um, model for project-based. And Interdisciplinary allowing content across multiple subjects is essential. We know life doesn't happen in a vacuum. So why are we learning um, math by itself when it really comes in context with the science, with the economy, with the culture, with the ability to effectively communicate the English language arts piece, <clears throat> the physical activity, the foreign language, all of the key pieces that we really want to, to bring into um, the class anyways. And so those are the ideas that we want to bring into these projects and allow for teams of teachers to work with groups of students to tailor it to the needs of the project and the students. So because of that, we wanna get rid of as many walls as possible. 
<clears throat> that's why in the title or the description of that, I talk about no walls. So we want to create learning neighborhoods with as little permanent walls as possible. Instead of having the traditional 900 square foot rectangle room with a front of the room with whiteboards, with desk and chairs and mounted cabinets to the wall and a big teacher's desk. We want to get rid of all the walls. We want to open it up with flexible furniture, flexible space, and flexible walls. That truly means that we're implementing walls that look permanent, but we can rearrange them. The dirt manufacturing system in Charlotte, which is uh, headquartered in Calgary, um, they provide dirt is D-I-R-T-T, -T, do it right this time. It's an environmental solutions company <clears throat> where they were trying to eliminate the destruction of every time a, a a different tenant comes into a strip mall, um, a storefront. They ripped everything that was there out, just put it to the landfill, rebuilt new walls. And so Dirt wanted to provide walls that could be reused and reconfigured to meet the new tenant's needs. So instead of us putting in permanent walls, we're putting in semi-permanent walls that look permanent, but with the facility team over a night or a weekend, we can redesign the space to meet the teacher's needs. So maybe day one of a project, we need three rooms to hold 30 students each because they're gonna talk about the overall scope of the project. <clears throat> We're gonna bring in community experts that are linked to the project. They're gonna explain the reason for the project the needs of the project, the outcome of the project, and then the teachers can then explain all the different checkpoints that will take place during the project I get your and explain grammys. those answers. Go ahead, Jim. I was just telling you that your voice was breaking up. You're and now I have, are you there? I am here. And I think you're saying my voice is breaking up. It was. Right. It's better now. Jim, I actually think that's you that is having the issue because he wasn't breaking up to me, but you were. So just, you know, I think your bandwidth is suffering right this minute. You'll have to watch. You'll have to watch the video to catch what Jeremy said that last five minutes. <laughs> well, that gives me a, a reason to take a drink too to catch a little bit of a break. So, um, but um, good to hear that it wasn't on my end. Um, but um, ultimately, I've seen in many schools where space limits teachers. So I wanted the ability to eliminate that as a um, a barrier for learning. And then the ultimately is, you know, I was a high school math and science teacher. And one of the number one complaints um, that teachers had is the students just got really involved and engaged in doing learning. And then the bell rings. Or you have students that are so bored, all they are looking for is watching the clock, can't wait for that bell to ring because they can't wait to get to the home or the next um, um, period in the school day. So we're getting rid of that. I mean, we're going to allow the teachers to decide the flow of the day for the students. They're going to decide which students need to go where at what time. <clears throat> Do pre-assessment before the project. They'll know which students are going to need what kind of instruction. They're going to design specific lessons to help them with that content so that they can be successful in the project. But it doesn't have to be everyone doing the same thing all the same time. If there are students that understand the content, why do they need to sit in instruction? They've already pre-assessed and demonstrated mastery. Let them do a different piece of the project. <clears throat> Let them follow their passion in something else that they really wanted to dive into. And those are really ultimately ways that we can kind of hinder some of those barriers along the way. 
Um, there. So this instruction is fairly unique and different in how it looks in the traditional um, way. And because of that, it's fairly innovative, although there are a lot of classrooms that are doing project-based learning across traditional um, public schools. So I'm not suggesting that that doesn't take place. I know there are a lot of great teachers doing those things. We're just intentionally implementing across all of our curriculum to make sure that every student is engaged in the same way, not just certain teachers here and there being able to do that. So one of the things I typically am asked is, what does a day look like, right? How do students interact and transition and things like that? Well. So let me just give you a quick example of a student in the exploration learning neighborhood, AKA exploration is ninth grade. Um, we're naming grade bands, different um, names because they have a specific theme. So for sixth, seventh and eighth grade, which is in the States, typically middle school, we call them, um, um, <laughs> now I said it and I, forget um, perspectives. And so perspectives, we're giving them perspective of what it means to do life, right? What it means to be a citizen in the 21st century. So we're theming our projects and our keys on things that are related to um, 21st century type skills, like learning how to do um, technology, informational literacy, um, understanding project management, understanding nutrition and healthy living and eating and all of those uh, survival skills, outdoor education, <clears throat> ensuring um, they have swimming skills, things like that. So those kinds of things will be for our ninth grade, the exploration, they are exploring all of the different journeys that they can do or pathways they can do as 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, which is our enterprise learning neighborhood. And so they're going to have a, an opportunity to explore in each of those journeys that are very much concentrated in each of those journeys, therefore allowing them to kind of have a better idea of how things are going forward. So here's an example of just controlling erosion at a nearby park, uh, a local stream, working with the county core engineers and city parks and recreation. And it's a real project that really will have impact and links with their um, specific learning. Um, this is our learning spaces, that neighborhood design with those blue walls being able to be moved around there, the dirt walls. It doesn't show any of the ceilings. Um, it's not an open classroom. It is very much a closed classroom, but allows um, for teachers to kind of rearrange and redesign for it. We're keeping our class sizes small. We really think that that helps with the student interaction and engagement and tailoring of instruction for it. We want to create those graduates that have this profile that is essential in the 21st century. We want to engage the community as we do that. We want them to have that that confident identity, but still be respectful, et cetera. Um, and basically what is essential is self-initiated work ethic. These are the five pathways that we're, we are looking at adding because of the specific needs in the, the local area here in Greene County with performing arts, visual arts, robotics and drones, biotechnology and engineering. And these are these projects that they'll be able to work towards um, within doing some of these projects. So in general, um, we'll be opening this year, sixth through ninth grade. It's eligible to all students. Um, 30 minute radius transportation will be provided by the local public school districts. Um, we're gonna allow um, our students to have specific extracurricular activities, although they may participate in any of the athletics at their local home districts. So we may not replicate. So we're not gonna have any of um, the traditional sports, but we'll have like competitive jump roping, drone racing, design um, bake-offs, um, design challenges, stuff like that, unique 
um, things that are very pertinent to the, today's um, community and needing. Um, we're always looking for partners, nonprofit companies, um, people that want to volunteer and be part of the school, and ultimately, um, people that want to support us financially because the instructional dollars is what we get. All the facility and all of the other upkeep and equipment and things um, we have to raise on our own. And so we're looking for support to help us school um, get up and running this next year. Um, we have the facility, we have a lot of the equipment, but uh, the pledge will help us kind of take it to the next level to provide more resources for our teachers to implement this kind of innovative education. So I would encourage anyone that's out there to go to our communitysteam.org um, forward slash pledge page and um, proceed to give us some funds to help us do this innovative education of the heart, mind, body, and soul. Is there any questions? I think I'll kick it off real quick. Um, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. I'm uh, Crystal Gamble with Mama Sweet Baby, uh, which is an online social media platform that kind of encourages anyone in learning at home experiences, especially homeschoolers. And my first question is, and it's funny because um, Julie actually mentioned it in the chat, how, what is a lottery process like to get into the school? So for us right now, um, we have open seats in every grade level and we're past the lottery date. So that means um, we still can accept more students in every grade level. However, the other two STEM um, designated schools that are uh, within a 30 minute drive of our facility, they have a, a lottery process every year and um, many students don't get selected. So if we have more applications than seats, all applications at a certain date that were received at that point in time go to a third party. They will randomly select who gets into the um, school. And those that don't get in get put on a wait list. And if any of those students um, currently in the school eventually transition away, um, then they're called up in that order if they want to be part of the school. Um, as of right now, we don't have anyone on the wait list. We're still accepting. Um, we'll go up to our facility for the first year and accept um, up to 230-ish um, students. And we're right around, we're close to 200 right now. So we're getting close to starting to um, have to cap certain grade levels for um, this coming fall. Thank you, I was curious about that. And it's, it's good to hear that you still have room. <laughs> yes. It is interesting. I've had a lot of different um, opportunities to pitch the school to different um, individuals. A lot are like construction companies coming in to refurbish our space. And I tell them, they like, well, what's gonna be here? And so I tell them, and then they keep asking questions. I keep telling them a little more. Um, and I've just had so many people say, man, I wish I was young enough to come back, go back to school. I would love to go to that kind of a school where you're bringing in workforce skills and you're bringing in projects that are linked with real world situations. And um, I even had some um, lady say to me, she goes, well, I wasn't really thinking about having children, but now I think maybe I will. I'm like, whoa, that's quite a, a statement. Maybe I need a lot to of power, dude. Market. Yeah, my marketing campaign there. Julie um, has a question um, on there. It says, are you struggling finding teachers like everyone else or are teachers excited and coming to you? That's a good um, question. So it's a mixed, all right? Um, I have a lot of teachers coming to me but I'm not accepting a lot of teachers that are coming to me. Um, a lot of teachers that come to me tend to just want to get away from whatever situation they're in right now 
and I, I'm, I'm not a, a, um, a school that wants teachers that are there for a paycheck. Um, I, want, I want teachers that are passionate about student learning and understand that every student is unique and we have to tailor our instruction in such a way. Pretty soon in the interview process, I find if their eyes glaze over and they're just like, <laughs> no, like, they're like, wait, no bells or wait, no textbook or wait, you mean there's what, no grades? I mean, they just start their head like it gets ready to explode. Um, and I know right away that they're not going to be, you know, someone that would be a good fit as a teacher. Dude, um, that's for, amazing. Yeah. yeah. But, but in general, a lot of teachers will be, oh, finally, this is how education, I want to do education. This is very much what I've been trying to do. <coughs> but I've had some limits here or there for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, so I've have I have teachers moving from other states that I've interacted with. I mean, I've been doing teacher prep now for 25 years. So I've have a lot of past students of mine who have sat under my tutelage about project-based learning and they want to do it, but they're really limited in where they're at. And now that I broadcast on social media, I'm starting this school, they're like, can I do project based? And I'm like, yes. And they're like, all right. So the, I'm there's a lot um, of teachers even move into the area specifically to teach here. I've even had families move into the area um, to go to school here. Um, in fact, one application today said that they're moving um, from where they're at in, in Ohio to be closer so that it's not as much of an issue with transportation. Because many Parents and guardians are so passionate about learning and their students, their children's learning. Um, they're willing to, to take and make sacrifices to help them be successful in the, in the 21st century. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to do is give a platform to empower the students to go beyond just the content, but to be thinkers, to be able to be innovators, to be someone that are problem solvers, that someone that has confidence, they're leaders, they can make a difference in the, the community in which they live. That's a huge portion of what it means to be a good citizen today. Bravo. I love that you use that word citizen because that's really what you're talking about here. We're talking about the next generation yep. um, and we have to care and we want them to care. And the best way to make them care is to involve them in the process. I agree 100%. I'm excited for those kids. And I'm excited that it's a K-12 school. And I think it's hard when some of the STEM schools start at sixth grade or seventh grade or eighth grade because they've had traditional schooling for the most part. <laughs> and then you have to change that culture which is hard to age, but to start them from the very beginning, it'll just be the way they think and the way they, the way they are. And I also interject, I've seen the opposite. I've seen kids that have come up through um, kindergarten to sixth and seventh grade. I don't know how to say kindergarten, I'm sorry. But um, to seventh grade, and then they're going into eighth or ninth grade. And I'm saying, oh, I fear for those teachers because these kids are hungry and they know they're in charge of their learning. And these teachers who are traditional schools don't know what's coming. So I've seen it both ways, Jeremy. And I also applaud you for going K through 12. We need an ecosystem of yeah. citizens that are working together. I agree. And my passion will be once we get this, uh, what I'm calling a flagship school in Xenia, then my goal is to go to another city um, in Ohio and start another one and then another city and start another and until I am not capable of continuing to start these kinds of schools in Ohio um, and I guess I'll retire at 90 or something like that but um, that's a that's been why I stepped away from um, higher education and um, trying to make a direct impact within the the learning environment for our students well, bravo to you, sir. Well, thank you. Do we have any questions from YouTube? Uh, I'm not leading us anymore. I'm sorry. I'm not pretending like I'm in charge here. I stayed uh, to what you said. 
<laughs> Actually, I'm a little bit curious. So if you are a student pretty much who's eligible anywhere in Ohio, you can attend the school. However, what, what area again? Is it central? Primarily? Southwest. Southwest Ohio, around the Dayton area. Um, okay. Could be close to Dayton area. Yeah. Okay. What do you what are your demographics looking like thus far as far as enrolled students? Um, so that is a great question that I cannot answer right now. <laughs> um, the reason why is no demographics are asked in our enrollment process up to date. Um, and once we get um, all of our software up and running in which we'll do the full scale enrollment process that we have to, to comply with the state and submit the information to the state of Ohio, then I'll know that. But um, until that point, I really don't have any um, demographics. Although I can tell you grade levels um, that they say they're rising into. And um, I, that's I think that maybe maybe gender is asked on the application, but not not anything else. Uh, my goal is to to find the the good fit, right? What are the students who want um, to be in charge of their learning and engage in the learning process? Um, and and that's one of the questions that the parent and guardian has to answer is the fact that. Um, they understand that the student must take ownership in the learning process and it's gonna be rigorous, but obtainable. And we accept all students, whether they're on specific um, accommodations or not, it, it doesn't matter. We'll help them along the way and, and encourage them in where, whatever level they are at to, to, to take it to the next level, right? Um, so rigor is different on every student level and will make it different for every student. Well, bravo, sir. I have to take off because apparently dinner has been ready for 20 minutes. But I, I wanted to hear what you had to say, and I'm glad you said it. So thank you. Well, thank you, Jim. I appreciate you staying on and getting a cold dinner. <laughs> I'm not it's not just a cold dinner it's going to be a shoulder too but uh, it's <laughs> understood cheers and I know and time is I know time is almost up but I want to pop in because I've heard a lot about your school and I've heard a lot about you and now that I've seen the presentation it's all true and it sounds fantastic and I wish I lived closer to Xenia than I do to Columbus but it is what it is maybe you know, are, maybe this will be your homes. next stop yeah, there are homes there are in this homes. area. You could just move on the yeah, side. Yeah, I bet. The man is relentless. Sounds fantastic. Maybe thank his you, next Jeremy. Story there. Yes. Julie and, Jake and Amy, thank you for the opportunity. I have enjoyed this so much. And good luck, Amy. Thank you. All right. Thank okay, you, Jeremy. I, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to an update as soon as that school's open. We have an October gift that maybe you can come back on and share your uh, opening if, if it happens by then. We'd love to hear about it and see some video on it and watch some of the kids working or even bring some of them with you. Uh, I would love it. I definitely will do so because um, I know uh, a lot of my marketing campaign it, it's frustrating because I don't have the pictures of my students, but that's because I don't have the students yet. So, so yes, by October, we'll have lots of projects being um, accomplished and definitely have an opportunity to You know, share. what you could do in October in, during the gift is you could, I mean, I know the kids don't typically want to be at school on a Saturday, but these kids are going to be different because the school is going to be different. Right. And I think they would probably do it, come in and do some stuff on their projects. And you could take us on a tour during gift. I think that'd be super cool. Sounds like a great plan. I would love it. All right. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you for the invitation. Sure. Anytime. <laughs>